After Tony Curtis died, Kim Novak confessed what he did. Tony Curtis was well known in Hollywood for his appearances in Some Like It Hot and Spartacus, but he also made the error of combining his personal and business lives. His preference for younger ladies complicated his life even further, making his family and admirers upset. He was married to six different women, had six children, had multiple relationships, and was involved in various scandals over his 85 years. Here are some interesting facts about the former Hollywood heartthrob. Growing up on an empty stomach Many people believe that rich movie stars have always been wealthy. For Tony Curtis, though, this couldn't be farther from the truth. Tony Curtis, as he became known and loved in Hollywood, was really born Bernard Schwartz in 1925. He was born and raised in Manhattan, where he shared a tiny room at the back of his father's tailor business with his family. Not only did the family have to share a tiny room, but they often lacked funds for food. Their financial circumstances deteriorated to the point that Tony and his siblings were placed in an orphanage for a month. While we'd want to claim that things only got better for the Schwartz family, that isn't the case. Tragedy seemed to follow Tony. Tony's life has been challenging since his first day on Earth. While his family didn't have money for food, they did have each other. Unfortunately, his family's stability was soon taken away from him as well. When Tony's brother was just 12 years old, a car killed him. Tony was a youngster attempting to cope with such a significant loss, but the blows simply kept coming. He would eventually discover that mental illness ran in his family. He had already lost one loved one and was going to lose two more. Mental illness stole his family. While a house is meant to be a secure haven, it wasn't for Curtis. He started to notice a change in his mother's temperament as the years passed. Tony remembered, when I was a child, mom beat me up and was very aggressive and antagonistic. He remembered his mother beating him innumerable times without completely knowing why. His mother was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia. While his mother received the assistance she needed and the family recovered, tragedy struck again. Tony's sibling had inherited his mother's mental disorder and required hospitalization. He was saved from a different life. Growing up in Manhattan has its own set of challenges. When you combine that with the tragedy that hovered over the Schwartzes, you get one difficult kid. Tony learned how to navigate the streets as he got older. During his boyhood, he was a member of a neighborhood gang whose major offenses were skipping school and stealing from the local dime shop. Curtis was 11 years old when a kind neighbor rescued him from a life of criminality by sending him to a Boy Scout camp. He was able to work off his energy and relax there. Tony's previous conduct had often gotten him into deadly street battles, but he was wise enough to safeguard his assets, his attractive face. He was a good-looking adolescent who knew it was profitable. Saying goodbye to Bernard Schwartz To help put food on the table, Tony found a job as a truck driver, but he knew that that wasn't the end for him and that greater things were on the way. As a result, he began attending acting courses. The dark cloud that was hovering over Tony's life appeared to briefly lift when a talent agent recognized him and contacted him. It wasn't just any old ordinary talent agency. It was David Oselnik's niece. Tony relocated to Los Angeles, changed his identity, and landed a deal with Universal Studios. His acting career began with fencing and writing instruction, as well as minor appearances in a few films. Curtis was pleased, but he was just interested in money and women's attention. He could never have predicted how huge he would become. Tony was nothing like they had seen before. Women were obsessed with Tony Curtis when he initially appeared on the scene. Why, you could ask? Our best opinion is that it was because Tony was unlike any other leading man in Hollywood. To begin with, he had large lips and blue eyes. He also introduced the market to a new, feminized, masculine attractiveness by plucking his brows and taking special care of his appearance. Aside from his stunning appearance, Tony was known for his signature ducktail haircut. Tony made some stunning decisions over his career, but this hairdo was never one of them. It even influenced Elvis Presley enough to incorporate it into his Hallmark style. A Legendary Love Story Tony co-starred in the romantic comedy Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe in 1959. 
What many people didn't realize at the time was that, according to Tony, the two had previously dated in 1949. Tony recalls many wonderful times with the celebrity, including barbecues and other activities on the beach. The couple made many joyful memories, but they didn't last long. While their romance ended, their narrative continued for quite some time. The couple expressed a wide range of feelings towards each other, most of which were negative. Curtis had already grabbed the attention of another film diva by this point. Janet Lee was hard to miss. Tony's job and love life were thriving despite his newness to the film business. He had always known he would get out of New York, but he never believed he would get to this stage. Janet Lee was one of Hollywood's most beautiful and gorgeous stars. She was difficult to overlook, but Curtis had no idea she would notice him. When the two began dating, fans went bananas. They immediately became Hollywood's it couple and felt ready to take their relationship to the next level. Tony and Janet intended to marry, but there was a stumbling block. Their only option was to elope. Tony and Janet were madly in love and wanted to make their love legally binding. Curtis, on the other hand, was under contract with Universal International, and they weren't keen on the concept of marriage. They were, just not to Janet Lee. Tony's attraction resided in his heartthrob image, and Universal International wanted him to marry co-star Piper Laurie. The business believed Tony and Piper might be Hollywood's next star pair, and spent three days attempting to persuade Tony not to marry Janet. They threatened to send him back to his life of poverty in New York in order to halt the wedding. They forgot that Curtis had learned to never back down from a battle while living in New York. So, Janet and Curtis made a break for it and eloped, marrying in Connecticut. Tony found his sweet spot. The wedding pair returned to Hollywood after eloping to face their destiny. Their marriage, however, had the reverse effect of damaging their careers. The crowd felt that Lee and Curtis improved each other. Curtis decided to try his hand at comedy about this time. He discovered his sweet spot and stuck film gold. People liked his sense of humor, but they eventually stopped laughing with him and began laughing at him. Curtis portrayed Cosma Baba in the 1952 film Son of Ali Baba. Tony's accent slipped during one of his lines, leaving everyone in stitches. He was intended to say, Yonder lies my father's castle, but instead he undered Yanda and Fada. Although they meant no harm, the crowd made fun of Curtis. Curtis, on the other hand, didn't see it that way. His family grew twofold. Tony and Janet's little family developed swiftly, and after they were married for a few years, they just didn't have one kid but two, virtually back to back. Their family increased from two to four in a short period of time. Kelly Curtis was born in June 1956, and Jamie Lee arrived in November 1958. Tony's whole life altered in a matter of years, and he became not only a spouse, but also a parent. Tony had previously excelled at everything he had attempted. Unfortunately, being a parent was not one of them. The film that changed his career. Curtis secured a main role in Some Like It Hot shortly after the birth of his second daughter, a role for which she became famous. Curtis portrayed a cross-dresser called Joe or Josephine in this 1959 picture. The picture was a smash hit, so much so that no one in the audience realized how much turmoil was going on behind the scenes. Marilyn Monroe was battling with a slew of personal troubles during the shooting and sometimes refused to leave her trailer. When she did, she would often cry before filming sequences. And while there was a rumor of tension between her and Tony on set, he later stated that it was all false and that his famous quote about kissing her being like kissing Hitler was taken out of context. According to him, the quote was sarcastic in response to being asked the same question over and over and actually went, it's like kissing Hitler. What are you doing asking such a stupid question to me? Jealousy is an ugly emotion. Tony's marriage to Janet surprised everyone since he was renowned for being a jerk. Maybe she influenced him? Sadly, that was not the case. Tony's adultery continued despite his vows and the wearing of a wedding band. Curtis spent much too much time at the Playboy Mansion during his marriage to one of Hollywood's most gorgeous ladies. He was also linked to Natalie Wood and admits to falling in love with his co-star Gloria DeHaven. Curtis, on the other hand, was envious 
and thought that his wife was cheating on him. He often called her numerous times to see where she was and who she was with. He was certain at one time that Lee was seeing his close buddy and singer, Frank Sinatra. Janet, on the other hand, had taken her wedding vows seriously, at least for the time being. A scene full of controversy and drama. Despite his divorce, Curtis opted to focus on his career and appeared in the epic 1960 movie Spartacus. However, as with most things, Curtis controversy quickly ensued. Curtis and Laurence Olivier filmed a very contentious sequence in the film. The sequence in which the two lathered each other was full of sexual chemistry and suggested an attraction between them. The producers chose not to shoot the moment since censors would most likely cut it anyway. The decision infuriated Tony and he pushed to get the sequence shot. To preserve the piece, the studio consented and the sequence was filmed. They didn't inform the performers that they didn't bother with sound since it wouldn't be used anyway. Curtis's struggle, on the other hand, generated some concerns about his personal life. Was Curtis keeping a secret? Was Curtis just battling for a contentious moment because he'd worked hard to memorize his lines? Or was he concealing something about his personal life? While Curtis was fantastic in his two main performances, it made many wonder whether he had ever passionately pursued men. He had, after all, portrayed a transgender woman in Some Like It Hot and bathed with another guy in Spartacus. Despite the rumors and allegations, Tony denied being attracted to guys. He went on to say that despite not being gay, he loved and embraced his brothers and sisters who were. His marriage fell apart. Curtis immersed himself in work instead of concentrating on his marriage and continued to accuse his wife of having an affair. After 11 years of marriage, Janet claimed to have had enough of his neurotic jealousy. It truly occurred after Lee insisted on fooling around with Sinatra behind his back. Lee and Curtis both realized their marriage was over and filed for divorce. Tony was exceptional at finding a rebound, as he was at most things in his life. He had no idea it would harm his reputation. Tony's will wasn't the only scandal. After the shock of their father's death wore off and fury set in, a shocking charge was leveled at the late Tony Curtis. Kim Novak, the star of the movies Picnic and Vertigo, gave it a performance in 1958. Kim alleged that Curtis drugged her at a party. He stated that she only had one drink before blacking out. When she awoke, she was naked and in her bed. She had no recollection of what occurred between the two instances and believes that Curtis was engaged in making that happen.